I used to make mixtapes when I was a teen, and I'll admit I wasn't very good at it, which is part of the reason I used to believe that tapes sounded bad. And I realized this after I was searching through some old tapes of mine and started re-listening to them, and I was unimpressed with my previous work. Uh, back then, I was more interested in making a copy of a friend's CD to save money or recording songs off the radio for the same reason. And sure, I made the occasional mixtapes for a few girlfriends, uh, but I know for a fact that I never cared about the quality of the recording, and I only cared about making a copy of something. But when I make mixtapes today, I'm all about the quality more than anything else. With the sale of cassettes being on the rise in recent years, I'm concerned that new adopters of tapes will come to the same conclusion that many did back in the late 80s, that tapes sound bad. And for good reason. Poorly recorded mixtapes and pre-recorded tapes sound bad. And to prove my point, I had purchased this new Olivia Rodrigo tape, thinking that it might sound a little better being produced on presumably modern equipment. And I tried comparing that to an old tape from 1985, and it didn't sound any better than this old one. And because digital music is available everywhere, even a casual listener will notice that these tapes sound bad in comparison to the higher quality digital version they're accustomed to hearing. Now, sadly, I don't think manufacturers have changed their methods of recording onto tapes, and I'd argue that they are still being made the same way and the same kind of equipment that stamp these out at a thousand miles an hour with no regard to quality. And for that matter, I think this Olivia Rodrigo tape is nothing more than merch. And that concerns me because someone who's dabbling into tapes for the first time might buy this tape and reasonably expect to hear a digital quality but will be disappointed and give up on tapes altogether based on how this sounds. And I think that's an unfortunate reason to abandon cassettes. So that's why I argue it's better to make your own mixed tapes because they're completely customizable, the quality is way better, and it's kind of fun to do. So in an effort to prove that tapes can actually sound fantastic, or if you've never made your own mixtapes and want to make them the best that you can, this video is for you because this is all about how to make the ultimate quality modern mixtape. All right, so having said that, I've come up with some criteria of what you'll need to create the ultimate quality mixtape. First, a cassette deck that can record, and obviously the better the deck, the better the tape will sound. I tend to like old tape decks better, just because I think that's when they were made at their peak. As you can see here, I have a Sony K770ES, which is a really good high-end deck. And I also have on top there a Sony TC WR690 dual cassette deck that I actually had in high school. Now this one isn't really that good, but what I'm getting at is you need a cassette deck that has some controls on it like recording level and maybe a few other things. Um, so when you use something like a boombox here that you could see, yes it may have a record option, but there are no other options to do anything. So I would recommend not using any of these and trying to get a uh, the highest end cassette deck that you can. And of course number two, you're going to need some cassette tapes. I tend to prefer old stock or new old stock if I can find any, and I say that because I prefer to record on either Type 2 or metal tapes, and new tapes, as you can see here, are only available in Type 1, which is a normal bias. Now, if you didn't know, there are essentially three tape types. There were four, but for the sake of this video, there were three. So like I mentioned, there's Type 1. That has the smallest dynamic range. Uh, type 2, which is also known as Chrome, that has kind of like a medium dynamic range. And finally, Type 4, which is metal, which has a very wide full dynamic range. So when it comes to recording, I consider Type 1 good, Type 2 better, and Type 4 best. And of course, I'm mentioning all this because when you do finally go to record onto a tape, uh, you need to know what you're recording onto in order to extract all that you can out of it and as far as audio quality goes. Now the one thing these tapes all have in common is the record protect notches. As you can see, they're all still in here. And that's the only thing that will indicate what a type one tape is. It just has the regular record protect notches. Now type two has the record protect notches and these other open holes. And finally on type four, it has the record protect notches and the side holes and the ones in the center. And I'm saying all this because it's important to know what tape you're recording on to get the best out of it when you're actually recording. Old cassette decks like this, you had to manually select what tape you had. But new decks use these sensors, and that's where the notches come in. So you need to know what tape you're recording on if you don't have a deck that can automatically detect what tape you have. 
Now this third one is optional, but I think it's important anyway, and that's a tape eraser. And it's helpful if you're using already recorded on old stock tapes to blank them out before you record new. Now I got this one off eBay. I think it's from the early 70s, and there's not even any electronics to it. It's just a rare earth magnet in there that blanks out the tape when it passes through. So let me play a section of this tape so you can hear that there's some sound on it, and then what it sounds like after I pass it through the tape eraser. All right, so clearly there is sound on this tape. So this is a fairly simple operation. Like I said, it doesn't plug in or anything. There's just a magnet in there. And you put it upside down, you pass it through. It only says you have to do it once. I like to do it more than once, two or three times, really. I flip it over. Again, I don't have to. There's magnets on either side of this thing. So just passing it through once or twice is fine. Um, but after that, that's it. You close it up and let's see what it sounds like now. And empty. Now, while I don't hear any sound, I do see on these VU meters here, they are bouncing a little bit. And there's no sound, so I think it's erased. I guess this is an artifact or a remnant of something that was on there. But as far as I'm concerned, this tape is erased. So uh, let's get on to my last suggestion. And of course, finally, you're going to want to choose the highest quality audio source that you can. And without getting into a huge discussion over this, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of opinions on what that possibly is, I'm just going to say use the highest quality that you can find. So if given the choice between you know copying a cassette like this or going digital, I would recommend using the digital source for this one since it's going to be much more dynamic than the cassette. Now one thing I like to do before I record on old stock tapes is to fast forward them all the way down and then rewind them all the way back. I don't know if this actually does anything. In my mind, it just resets the tape and gets everything moving again. So I don't know if there's any science behind it, but that's what I do. So remember when I mentioned about tape types a moment ago? This is a type 1 tape, and this tape deck knows it because of the notches on the cassette. This is when it matters that you know what tape you're recording on. Some tape decks, typically pre-1985, did not have this auto-detect feature, so you'll need to manually select the type. As you can see, even my high school Sony deck had the auto-tape type feature, but my friend's older Sony, from 1981, did not. It's also important to select the right type, so the deck can use the proper recording playback configurations to maximize the tape dynamics and recording quality. So if your deck has a calibration or ability to change the bias or recording level to match the tape type you have, you're going to want to do that before you start recording, of course. So if you have a deck that allows you to do that, do that first. And I'm going to use my phone as my digital source here. I'm going direct into the tape deck. And I pulled a song from the YouTube Music Library that we can use to record and listen to the playback without worrying about any copyright issues. And just when you thought I was done talking about tape types, I'm not. And that's because this is where we get to set our recording levels. And if you have a deck that tells you what kind of tape it is, that red line is going to show you where you want the meters to peak at. So that was a type 1. This is going to be a type 2. And the meters are going to be at the same spot right there. You can see it says chromium dioxide. It tells me. But watch what happens when I put in this metal tape. Uh, not only is it going to say the word metal, but that little red meter uh, right there doesn't change. That means I can record a lot higher on a metal tape. So that's where I would want to peak on this particular kind of tape. So that's why it's important. And you can see I didn't go all the way up on this one. That's why it's important to know what kind of tape you're using before you record. And remember, not all decks have that handy little peak meter helper. So if you have a deck like this one here, um, shoot for the Dolby Double Ds if you have it. Or if anything else, there is a zero usually right in the middle. Aim for that if you don't have the instructions telling you to do something else. All right, and I'm finally ready to start recording. I'm going to advance the tape about five seconds to get past the tape header, and then I'll get onto some actual tape so I can start recording. Next, I'm going to press record and then pause and set the recording level so it peaks at the right spot so it doesn't go over the red lines, as you'll see here. And as you can tell, that is way too loud and peaking way too high. So you see I'm simply dialing it back down to where the peak meter tells me I should be. I'm now ready to begin recording. And for the sake of this video, I'm actually going to play the audio of the taped recording while you're listening to it. So here we go.
I assume you're able to hear the subtle differences between the digital source and the tape, which I'd probably describe as a little warmer or rounder sounding. I also didn't detect any audible tape hiss at this normal listening volume, which means that I have an appropriately high signal to noise ratio, and I was able to achieve this by knowing the tape type, so I could record using those biases, all while keeping the signal levels peaking at their proper max. So whether you're venturing into mixtapes for the first time, or if you're getting back into them again, I hope this video was helpful in your quest in achieving the highest quality modern day mixtape. If you like what you saw, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching.